Many of you have quilting questions. They are sent to me in emails, messages, and comments. So many of them just cannot be answered in a paragraph. So now it's time for another episode of The Quilt Coach. Some of the questions I'll be answering today are, what's an easy way to lay out a charm pack? Where do I measure from on a pinked edge? Are rotary blade sharpeners worth the money? And several more. So stick with me and I'll show you how to do it. Hi there, I'm Karen Brown of Just Get It Done Quilts. I give you tips, tricks, and strategies to help you make the quilt that you wanna make. And if you like what you see, please hit that subscribe button. So coming in today by email, Luann Astra has asked, how do I deal with those pesky pinked edges on pre-cuts? How do you line them up to get a quarter inch seam? Well, first of all, not all pinked edges are equal. They vary in size and shape, depending on the manufacturer. And more than likely, each machine that cuts them cuts them slightly different. So the bottom line of this is that you can never measure from the bottom of the V or the top of the V because it's not consistent. The issue is not if the seam allowance is a quarter of an inch, but where is the actual seam supposed to be? So make a practice piece out of three pieces. Be sure to roll all your fabric over so that when you press, nothing is left in the seam. And then measure to check your accuracy. Personally, I use a ledge to keep my work straight. And it doesn't matter if the edges are pinked or straight. I move the ledge to where, if I butt the fabric up to it, I get the sewing line in the right spot. So for this set of fabrics, my sewing ledge goes here. And for these, the sewing ledge goes there. So just be flexible and do that practice piece. And if you want to learn more about a sewing ledge, see my video, Five Quilting Hacks with Masking Tape. L. Thomas asked by email, what do I think of rotary blade sharpeners? Are they worth it? I am married to a man who has always taken sharpening blades very seriously. After 30 years of marriage, I too take my cutting tools seriously. I just did a video on how to cut straight and good form does make your blades last longer and caring for them by not just dumping them into a drawer will also make them last. But eventually the blades still go dull. Blade sharpeners come in several different forms. There are electronic ones costing around $65 US that work with the 28, the 45, and the 60 millimeter. And then there's manual ones around $18 US that you buy for each particular size. So I see a lot of complaints online about both types of sharpeners, that the blades are often duller after they've sharpened them than before. Much of that is just not knowing how to use them or not having enough hand strength for the manual ones. No matter if you have a knife, scissors, <laughs> ice skates, or a rotary blade, the key to sharpening is knowing the angle of the blade. Not the whole blade, just those last millimeters at the end. So if you have let your blades go very dull or the manufacturer's angle is different than the sharpening tool, you have to do a lot of sharpening to get that clean edge back. Many people just don't have the patience or time to invest into doing it well. You also need hand strength on the manual ones to do it properly. And then you need to clean and maintain them. For me, one of the big factors is this is another item that I need to store and keep track of. And the electrical one, you would need access to power. So you need to weigh all these things. Personally, I purchased my rotary blades in bulk. I always have quantity on hand and have no hesitation to switch out that blade if it needs a new one. And when I fill up one of these containers with old blades, I spend the time to sharpen them with my manual sharpener. It has two levels of grit. The black is a fine grit and the yellow is a coarse grit. And we start with the coarse grit taking 20 to 30 spins on both sides of the blade. And then we repeat with the fine grit. It takes a bit of effort, but the results are worth it. Barbara Vandermeer sent me an email saying, 
there's got to be a better way that will make it easier and have everything be the right size and square for the Bjorn block. If you are wondering what the Bjorn block is, it is a block that looks like this. It's a block that we see in a number of the pieced animal blocks around the snout and around the ears. It is very similar to the flying geese one at a time method, but here the large rectangle is wider so that the HSTs do not overlap and are at the sides of the block. These are really cute, attractive blocks. You might have jumped into a block without a good grounding in the basics. Cut accurately, sewing straight, and a really good ironing technique. And with this block especially, you need to press properly. The top of this block is a lot less stretchy than the bottom. So if you swish when you iron, this block will very easily distort and go out of square. The other thing is these pieces can be small, which is also a more advanced skill as it's harder to get right as you don't have the long seams to work with. And the last is construction. Many pattern makers will have you sewing from this side of the block, marking the diagonal on the smaller pieces, flipping and pressing. I personally would mark the large rectangle. I recommend using a header or leader piece to trap all the threads and then just give it a small twist so it aligns with the beginning of your block. And when you start sewing, it won't distort and have your needle positioned just on the outside of your marked line. And since you are often making many of these at the same time, I would make a template to make it fast and easy. Laura Heath sent me a message on Facebook saying, I'm nervous about cutting. What if I do it all wrong and waste all my good fabrics? Well, there are two parts to this problem. How do I cut well and how do I choose the right project for my fabric? The first is just practicing on scrap fabric, old shirts, old sheets, practice making long strips, practice making squares. <laughs> Follow my tips in my video, how to cut straight. And remember, in quilting, we do not measure in microns. The second part is what if you do it all wrong? I do know that it's difficult to take a chance when you only have a finite amount of a favorite fabric. So when you audition your fabric, take a look at it in the size and shape that you'll actually use it in. Then fold the other fabrics to see what they'll look like next to it. You are looking for the contrast and the color harmony that will make you happy. And what is the worst that can happen? You can cut it all wrong. Then you find a pattern that works with the pieces that you've cut. It doesn't look like what you wanted it to. Well, that's part of the quilting journey in building your quilting skills. I just finished this quilt and I love these dark blues and there are a lot of them, but I am still very surprised at how light this whole quilt turned out to be. Doesn't mean I was wrong. I have just learned more about how fabrics interact with each other. And the third possibility is that you'll use it all up and then you'll find a better pattern for it later. Well, you can say this about anything. The good news is that there are lots of amazing fabric designers out there putting out stunning fabric lines year after year. So there'll be another amazing fabric next year for you. I also recommend that you watch my video playing with fabric. These are five fabric exercises that will train your eye to see the full potential of your fabric and what it can do. Noni Franca asked over on Facebook if I had a quick and easy pattern for charm packs. I don't normally cut my charm squares. I find the premium on them high so that I don't want to waste any threads on these at all. So my go-to is I make three equal piles of fabric, separating them into light, medium, and dark values. And I use my phone to take a black and white photo to be sure that I'm on the right track. And then I lay them out three at a time, drawing one fabric from each pile, making sure that there's a good contrast in pattern. Sometimes I need to switch a couple, but I try to resist doing this too much. And this gives me a small flimsy, so I'm often putting a border on it. With a four and a half inch border, this quilt finishes 36 by 40 inches. And this is what I do with my charm packs. If you are new to quilting and don't know much about pre-cuts, please watch my video, What You Need to Know Before You Buy. 
So that's it for today. If you have any questions that you would like answered, send your questions to info at justgetitdonequilts.com and put Quilt Coach in the subject line. But also take a look through my library of videos because there's a good chance I may have already answered your question. And if you haven't watched it yet, take a look at my interview with Angie Wilson of Gnome Angel. We had so much fun talking about her quilting journey and revisiting some of her quilt alongs that by the end of the interview, I had signed up for this year's 100 Day 100 Blocks Kinship Sew Along. I'll leave a link to that in the notes below. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. Don't forget to subscribe and hit that bell beside the subscribe button so that YouTube will notify you when I make new videos. You can also follow me on Facebook, Instagram, and Pinterest at Just Get It Done Quilts and sign up to my newsletter on my website at JustGetItDoneQuilts.com. So take care and I'll see you next time.